there was a resurgence. What had happened was there was a guy named Patrick that had came to us a while after Parade of Chaos and offered us a very large sum of money to do a new album. For some odd reason, he found Rob Horner's email address. He emailed Rob Horner. Rob calls me and uh, is like, this kid called me, his name's Patrick, he's backed by a millionaire or his favorite band of all time, and he wants to give us 15 grand a year, basically $45,000 a person to do three records, and all we have to do is tour in the summer. So I'm like, 15 grand, huh, for one record, a uh, person, yeah. <laughs> when me, me and Russ and Dan, when we were done, we were done, but the kind of figures this kid was talking to everybody was mind-blowing, and I never thought I'd make that kind of money in a band, so of course we're like, yeah, let's do this. So we get the original, basically not original, but in my mind, the, the quintessential Zayo lineup. No offense to what's going on now, but as far as like Zayo, you know, not happiness, just good Zayo, um, would be, um, you know, Liberate. You know, Jesse and Rob kind of get in touch with us, and they're like, you know, would you guys want to do, do another record? This kid's talking about, you know, giving us each an advance of thousands of dollars and we'll be able to do this record. And if it goes somewhere and finally takes us, takes Zayo to the next, you know, mountain that it needs to climb, awesome. If not, we'll just break up and we'll have all this money anyway. Some friendships have been restored and people were willing to give it a try. And then we met, you know, everybody got together as the band, you know, Dan, Russ, all of us were all sitting around at Dan's house. And the kid that wanted to do the record label flew up to uh, our hometown, came up, talked with us, had his whole contract written out, and we read all over it, and it was like pretty much too good to be true because, I mean, it was. But he came up with, you know, half of the money he was going to give us. So all of us are, you know, super into this because of the money at the time. And, you know, we get the checks and we're all stoked, and we look at the contract, we all sign it, and we kind of started getting back in the swing of doing the band with Jesse and Rob in it, me and Dan and Russ. We all get our checks, it's all cool and um, fine and dandy and we start practicing, writing and it's going really cool. I'm driving, meanwhile, you know, um, freaking 400 miles a week. I start getting held out about that after a while and, and then it starts getting taxing and then money starts coming into it again. And as that started, that's definitely when my thoughts started to come again where we need to do this for real because I'm having too much fun again and writing these songs, I'm actually really excited about this. And it almost turned away from the money because I was like, wow, this is really cool. I feel like this is maybe something we should be doing. And you know, I, I, I'm pretty, I know Russ felt the same way. And monetarily it was worth it. Uh, you know, not necessarily, you know, on my aspect, but everyone's. And we began writing. We had written a few songs, like uh, uh, The Rising End was in its early stages and uh, Praise the Golden Machine. And then, a couple weeks after that, when we're getting ready to leave, Patrick doesn't call us. Barry calls me. I didn't get the record. I didn't get the money for the record yet. I, I'm wondering what's going on. Call Patrick. Doesn't get, I can't get a hold of this, the kid at all. And, you know, about a week before we go into the studio, we get the call, oh, nope, it's all gone. It's folded. And, you know, it's all just down the dumps. They told me that his backers backed out on him. I guess there was somebody in the family that had some health issues, and they just weren't, you know, able to really deal with this whole situation at all. So it kind of completely all in, you know, a week fell completely to nothing. But we've already started writing all these songs and we were all excited to do this record and we're all stoked to do the band again. So that's kind of where the whole ferret thing came into play because me and Jesse talked. We've known Carl forever and Jesse thought, hey, you know what, Why don't if we want to do this, I'm going to call Carl and see what he would do. Carl says, hey, do we have a shot? We have a real shot of signing Zale and we're both Rick and I like, didn't even hesitate. Sign yeah. up right now. Like, yeah. sign up. Give them whatever they want. Yeah. And like, it was the we, first time we, like, it was the first band that ever got in advance. It was the first time. It was like, yeah. you know, it was a cool step for Ferret, you know? And it was uh, a big step. For yeah. Ferret. It was really, a, it was one of our first risks. And, uh, 
you know, it's, it's definitely, you know, it's paid off. And it's not like we're backstroking in money from them. But, uh, you know, the record's definitely been successful. And, you know, the next record, we're in a great spot for that to, you know, just to keep going. And, you know, definitely Jesse gave me the, the story of how he had to, you know, make Carl want to do the record and how he worked out everything. And, and I know all it was was, hey, Carl, Zane wants to do a record on Ferret. Carl was like, cool, let me see if I can do it. <laughs> so there wasn't really that much work involved, I don't think. But so Ferret started getting on board with everything. And Carl was getting excited about it, you know, and everything was cool. And then that was kind of right around the time when we went and had a meeting with Dan about doing this band for real. And we kind of gave, on, you know, gave him like a four-day period to, to say if he wanted to do this 100% or if he was going to have to do the shop and we weren't be able to tour as much as we wanted to tour because we wanted to do at least seven months a year, do like go crazy and do this for real. Dan starts not coming to practices when, you know, I'm, excuse me, when I'm there, um, driving there, you know, like it's like eight hours of my freaking day. He's not coming to practice because he's asleep. Then some stuff happens with um, some like addiction stuff, you know, with him and that Russ and, and Scott are just not cool with, you know, at all. And I'm not cool with it either, but I, I was there for him a lot through those times. Pretty much. I was saying I'll do this full time, you know, okay, you know, and Jesse was saying things like, you know, we're back as brothers again, it was the Liberate lineup, and, and he was talking about getting all our names tattooed on him and things like that, and then I found out, you know, a week later that he's been talking to someone else for two weeks because he wants to go on tour in two weeks and make money, and if I'm in the band, and he knows I'm not going to go on tour in two weeks, therefore, I mean nothing because I'm standing in the way of someone making some money. Little did we really know that, you know, in the back of all this stuff, Jesse's talking to jo Josh Ashworth about, you know, if Dan's not 100% dedicated, I, I wanted to have some kind of backup plan or whatever. So if Dan doesn't want to do it, I'll get somebody else to do it. So that's why he called Josh or whatever after I found out what was going on. But we were talking to Dan and then Jesse brought that to my attention that, you know, if Dan doesn't want to do it, Josh Ashworth said he would. So I'm like, all right, the blinding of it, the, oh, we have to do this, the, the you know, kind of manipulative things that you get said to you when you're, when people's lives are at stake or whatever, you know, kind of comes into play and un, very awkwardly and ill-willingly me and Russ agreed on if Dan didn't want to do this, do Zayo full steam. We needed somebody that would do it full steam. So the last day came to when Dan was going to tell us if he was going to do the band or not. And Dan never said he did, couldn't do the band. He just said that he didn't really think he could. He didn't really know if he could. He didn't want to leave his shop if, you know, just because of the instabilities. He didn't know if it was going to work. He was a little worried about it. But he never really once said, I'm not in. I'm definitely not in. Basically, they forced me to kick him out. I don't want to cause any problems because everything's cool now. But like my perspective is, you know, especially Russ, really uncomfortable with, with the behavior going on. And they basically were like, well, Jesse has balls. He'll tell anybody anything he thinks. And he's always a scapegoat for being the dickhead. So let's have him kick Dan out of the band. You know, and, and for me, it sucked because I was like, finally, we're back together. And we all have money in our bank account. And it's all going to be OK because it's always OK when you got the money, right? You know, so. Yeah, so we kick him out, and I have other people, you know, that were around, and they know, you know, it, it freaking killed me to, like, kick out my friend, especially when he's freaking going through all this Jesse was putting words into Dan's mouth about not wanting to do the band. You know, we know you don't want to do it. We're not going to hold it against you, man. You're our brother. We love you. Everything's, you know, cool if you can't do it, man. It sucks. We would love you to do it, but if you can't, we, we can find somebody else, and we're going to keep doing this band but if you can't, then whatever. I think I took it very well, and I just stepped down. And I guess that was the death of the original, you know, incarnation until Funeral Bell.